I'd like to say I'm delighted to welcome you all, an international audience, to the launch of this fabulous book. Communities of Activism, Black Women, Higher Education and the Politics of Representation. Edited by Dr. Jan Etienne. The launch is hosted by the Department of Geography and organized by the Womenist Higher Education Research Network here at Birkbeck, of which I'm a member. I'm just briefly going to go through the format for the evening. We will begin with an address from the Department of Geography, followed by Dr. N Dr. Jan Etienne introducing the book. Then we will have three keynote speakers. This will then be followed by individual contributions and short readings from the book, then a Q&A, the publisher's addre address, and finally, a dub poem to take us out. Can I say welcome? Could I take the opportunity now to welcome Professor Melissa Butcher from the Department of Geography here at Birkbeck for the welcome address and a few housekeeping points. Thank you so much, Carmelita, and it's just such a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm not going to take up very much time at all. I want to get out of the way, actually, because there's an absolutely stellar lineup of fantastic uh, voices and uh, for everyone to really enjoy this evening. So I just want to welcome everybody. We have over 300 people online tonight, which is just a fantastic turnout and a testament to Jan and the work that Jan does. Um, we're welcoming you virtually. We hope to be face to face again at some point soon, but, um, but it is great that you can make it online tonight. Um, we really want to celebrate Jan's work. Jan has been part of our department in geography since 2012, although she's a much longer history with Birkbeck. Uh, she's been teaching with our students. Unsurprisingly, students absolutely love Jan. Um, lots of uh, lots of very positive feedback from our students and they heard about tonight. He's also more recently an honorary uh, re working with us as an honorary research fellow and um, we're really pleased that we're able to, to launch the book because it is just so important and so timely. Uh, before joining us in geography, Jan worked in the Department of Social Policy and Education and I think um, the work that she's doing, her research and her teaching really encapsulates her lifelong dedication to understanding the role of education uh, in questions of social justice, both as representing injustices, so questions of inequality of access and attainment, but also how education is one of our most important, one of our most powerful tools for, uh, for fighting social injustices as well. And these are themes that she takes up in her new book that she's edited, this collection of, of essays. Communities of Activism, Black Women, Higher Education, Politics of Representation. Uh, it, it couldn't be more timely um, with the uprising that was globally, new forms of activism and solidarity. We're thinking about how to act collectively and the role of women in that collective action and all the things that the that it brings some of the overarching debates down to day. Thinking about, really think about um, how black and academics for the challenges we see every day. In effect, I've learned um, she, She's focusing on nighttime work and the role that's taking on black communities. But also, importantly for us at Birkbeck, um, Jan's work is focused on the levels of attainment of black students. And the problem, the challenge that we also face at Birkbeck. And I'm absolutely privileged to have Jan continuing to work with us at Birkbeck to address this challenge, but not just decolonizing the curriculum and uh, developing models of anti racist education. Um, I'm going to hand over to Jan now and, and back to Kamalita. But before I do, just a couple of housekeeping. Yeah, I, everyone's um, mics should be off. So all of the, the guests tonight um, should have their mics off. So 
uh, and that will help us manage just the, the background noise that's coming through, as, as you can um, hear, there's a little bit of background noise there. Uh, so all mics should be off uh, apart from our speakers, um, but feel free to ask questions. So um, I've, I'll be monitoring the chat bar on the side. So anytime people want to ask questions, just pop it in the chat bar. Uh, I'll collect, collect questions and we will have some Q&A. Um, Carmelita and Jen will come back to some time. You don't need to change. Uh -uh. Just take, take, off, take us off the video. Okay. Can I just say... Yeah, if people can turn off their mics, that would be great. Um, also, really importantly for this evening, uh, there's a 25% discount on the book. So uh, we will put the address up uh, on the in the chat bar as well. So keep an eye out for that. We'll regularly pop that up. Um, and you can email the publishers and you'll get a 25% discount on the book as well. Great. So as I say, it's a brilliant book. Um, so again, welcome everyone um, and, and thanks to Jan for all her hard work in the department and also in just continuing to produce this kind of the material that she does in her research. Um, Can I... Thank you and hand over back to Carmelita. Thank you, Professor Butcher. Um, can I remind everyone again, briefly, as participants, could you kindly turn off your mic whilst someone is speaking? The background interference in the last presentation was difficult. Did everyone, is that clear with everyone? Because oh, we might have to mute, mute you remotely and then that might also be difficult. Can I take the opportunity now to welcome Dr. Jan Etienne, Associate Lecturer, Social Policy and Education at Birkbeck, an editor of Communities of Activism. Welcome, Dr. Etienne. Thank you very much, Carmelita. Greetings to you all, family, friends, colleagues, brothers, and black sisters from across the African diaspora. It is a tremendous honor for me to be here to be able to address something which is a collaborative work. Myself and 11 sisters, black sisters working as activist educators in education, higher education, working on the front line in some very tough, demanding services. So I'm delighted that I have an opportunity just to say a few words about the vision for this book and why at this particular time, this particular publication could not come at a better time. Of course, we are on a mission. We have been involved in this project for some time now. Those of us who are actively working in education appreciate that we have a huge responsibility. Not only is this respons responsibility very much about the organization that we work within, it is very much about our families, it is very much about this fight to tackle, to address structural inequality, structural racism in particular. We have already seen that black lives matter in so many different regards. The merciless killing of George Floyd took us to a new level inside higher education. So not only do we take on board our responsibility as educators to begin to assist our departments, our entities with tackling this huge issue, we do take on board our womanist responsibilities to the family, to the wider black community. And why we stress this responsibility, I take on board the individual chapters in this publication, chapters which deal with knife crime, chapters which deal with police awareness training, and the responsibility that we have to work with agencies 
to do better for our communities. Not only it is, is, is it focused on our young people, in particular, the messages around issues such as drill music and the interpretation of the lyrics in such music. Not only it is about how we have had to think carefully about the British education system and what it is doing or not doing for our young black learners. But we take on board issues such as attainment, achievement, and these chapters focus very much on what we could be doing in order to make things better. And I want to stress also primarily our role inside education as leaders, as academics, as individuals who face double, triple discrimination. Whether this is grounds of our faith, whether this is on issues around our gender, whether it is focused very much on sexuality, we know that we have quite a battle inside higher education. So we are together, we are collaborative in our approach. And as we move forward, we consider the responsibility that we have with other sisters across the globe. So in issues such as violence against women, violence against black women in particular, we stand tall in solidarity. And so the vision is very much part of this responsibility, which we know and we hold dear. Two years ago, we held the Womanist Higher Education Conference and the several messages that we received from this particular conference set us on this path to guide higher education institutions, set us on this task to do better. So later on, you will hear a little bit, some insights from these chapters. You will have an opportunity to question, to assert your views. Ultimately, we take on board this need to keep the pressure on. And what I mean by that, we know that Black Lives Matter, this kind of slogan is here, we want it to be here to stay. We want to make certain that we do not let this momentum disappear. We are hell-bent on doing something positive inside higher education. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jan Etienne. That was a passionate passionate statement. I'd now like um, to introduce one of our key speak, the first of our key speakers, Professor Beverly Bryan, former professor of language education at the University of the West Indies and co-author with Stella Dadsey and Suzanne Sharp of the iconic book, Heart of the Race, Black Women's Lives in Britain. Welcome, Professor Bryan. Okay, all right, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me, Jan, to say a few words uh, about the book. Good afternoon to everybody. It's just after um, 12 here in Jamaica. It's a bleak day. I think the hurricane might be, might be coming um, soon. Hope not, though. Okay, so as I say, thank you for the inv invitation to contribute to the launch of Communities of Activism. Um, this book could not have been launched at a better time when so many young people are boldly challenging institutional racism and its structures in different ways and in different places. This book is adding to that challenge. It's a book of intergenerational narratives presenting black women talking about their own work, their research and their strategies, um, showing how they're combating racism and translating that activism into higher education and training. The, I found the writing, I thought it was very engaging, varying from those discussions, the more political discussions about the neoliberal um, capitalist system that's at the beginning, 
And then we had um, interviews, blog posts and grime, um, personal narratives of achievement. And even the, the, the one I found really engaging was the letter um, from a mother to her son on his milestone 30th birthday. So they're different types of writing, but they're all looking at this topic and how do we deal with the structural inequalities that we're facing or in, across the world, but particularly in the UK. So throughout all of, the, all of this, the book um, pinpoints problems that have been with us and uh, concerned us for decades, particularly uh, those problems that young people face are coming out of a system of racism spawned um, through a centuries old imperialist project. These are familiar topics to black women, failing education and a failing criminal justice um, system. But what I took from the book was all the chapters show how black women are intervening in their own sphere, whether they are researchers or whether they work with the police trainers or whether they work in the community. Um, but early on, I was particularly interested in early on, the book highlights the problems of the academy uh, sisters, uh, scholar activists, as one writer refers to them, who, who want to know how best to get involved in these issues. Um, several of the writers openly um, and some indirectly talk about the womanist perspective. This is something that I, I remember us talking about, certainly in the, when um, Alice Walker first broached um, and put that on the table. It's something that we do, we discussed. We didn't take it on, but we understood what it what it meant. It really was about looking more closely at the self, but seeing the black woman as closely connected to a community that she was part of that community and and she could not stand as a woman on her own, but in 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 it's in, not integrated, but really involved in what the community was experiencing. And that I felt was very important. And these activist scholars in these books, in this book, they talk about giving voice to the voiceless. There's a sense in which the community has got to be, we've got, we've got to make sense and, and support the, uh, our communities. And fight, not just support them, but really research the problems and find solutions. However, what I thought was important coming as I'm coming from the outside and coming with a uh, with a with a past history, um, the book recognizes that a lot of this work has been going on um, for some time and has been going on on the outside. Yes, most of you here will know of this. Um, you you've already mentioned Heart of the Race, and this was a book that was written by three of us who are, again we're all teachers. Um, who really want, who really collected the narratives of experience and resistance on these topics that, are, that come out in the book. So a lot of this work, has, let's say it started, it started before. And so the next question that I found in the book was to think about what, what has worked, what needs to be done, what needs to be done differently. And I thought that was also an interesting interrogation that um, Jan and her colleagues brought to the book. Um, one writer interrogates the notion of, uh, of whether um, you can get pro productive activism in higher education, because you're talking about um, a structure which, is, which you could say is there to perpetuate a particular type of ideology. So you'll always be in uh, in that kind of um, oppositional relationship um, to it. Um, she mentions decolonizing the curriculum, which is a term I've come across more recently, um, even though I think it's, again, I think it's something that we've been involved in for some time. And this writer who talks about decolonizing the curriculum, she answers a question in the affirmative but says that it must really be seen as guerrilla activity. And I think that's a useful phrase, recognizing that there's a structure that you might not always be able to confront directly, but you must find ways in which you can um, begin to challenge, uh, challenge that, that structure. She, recognizing how embedded it is. 
So she talks about allowing students to excavate its hidden knowledge, supporting students in their own inquiry and research, and, co and coaching students um, to ask what I call um, to question, make ask robust questions of the analytic process. And I think that's really hard. We know that, well, I found that in higher education that sometimes students don't want to ask those questions. They want to know what you want them to ask. And, and that's why we have to strive for that kind of independent thinking uh, uh, amongst our students. Um, I would also want to say about this decolonizing question. I remember doing an interview with a young man at another university who was a history student. And we talked about some of the things that we used to do. We talked about things like um, campaigns for anti-racist, anti-sexist materials that started in schools, um, campaigns to um, include more um, black teachers um, in, in schools, to look at ways in which we could change some of those employment practices and so on. So I think decolonizing is something that, that, uh, that we can say has been around in different ways for some time, but it also needs to be broader. I think the subject matter that we should talk about decolonizing also needs to be broader. We, we, we mostly talk about literature and social science, but I also think things like statistics need to be decolonized as, uh, as well, because there's a way in which the, those who use that, that really- Professor um, Bryan, can I, can I sorry, sorry to change. But can I give you another minute? Oh, another minute. OK, yes. all right. So let, let me very quickly um, um, summarize what else I, I wanted to uh, wanted to say. Um, in, in talking about the decolonizing, I think, think the most important thing to think about is how about how we not just change a curriculum, but how we change the power structures and the power relations. Yes, because a power structures do not yield they have to be dismantled and they they don't and they have to be that has to happen bit by bit and i think the scholar activists in this book really talk about that i think we also need to do more research um some of the research has been suggested bef before um on the topic that's been mentioned before the knife crimes i think that's really is is very important but not not research by um, Pete by black women Professor within Professor Bryant, the Professor okay. Bryant, could I thank you for your contribution? Okay. Very insightful. I now need to move on to our second keynote speaker, Professor Phyllis Shepherd, Associate Professor of Religion, Psychology and, and Culture at Vanderbilt. University USA. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you and good evening. Um, I want to first um, thank Dr. Jan um, for inviting me to this, to be a part of this very important and exciting conversation. I can see that we're off to a good start. Um, and I just want to say um, I met or encountered, first encountered um, Dr. Jan, um, via the internet for a conference I was organizing, Womanist Ethnography. And um, in what was a, what we call a Hail Mary effort, I wrote her an email and said, could you just zoom into this conference? Um, I, her book had just come out, Womanist Ways of Learning. And um, she did more than that. Um, she used her womanist feet and her resources and came here to Nashville, Tennessee, USA at Vanderbilt University and present it. And um, I'm trying to get her to come back because uh, the feedback from the um, participants was, can you bring her back? And every chance I get, I'm trying to get her on Zoom. So I thank her, but I also want to say up front, I thank the authors, the essayists, and this volume. I'm going to keep talking because it has both confirmed and the whole volume has confirmed and challenged me in in ways that um, I wasn't expecting. But let me start with this. The first black teacher 
I ever knew was my great grandmother, Hattie Booker Peterson. She was born in 1883 in Monroe, to Monroe and Georgia Booker, both of whom were born into the Southern slaveocracy in Georgia. She was their firstborn child, who at the age of 16 became a teacher in a one room school in the state of Georgia. She lived in a place where 10 years later, her brother, who had served in World War I would be murdered, dragged through the town by a horse because a group of white men became enraged that he bragged about receiving veterans benefits. In bringing stories of her teaching black children and the murderous world in which she lived, in which we lived, she taught me to notice, to speak up, resist, and to teach what is in the books and what is needed to survive. I give thanks for her this morning. I borrow from the poet Cheryl Clarks to argue, for a woman is to be a lesbian professor in a white dominated, capitalistic, misogynistic, racist, homophobic, imperialist culture, such as that in North America is an act of resistance. The book and in each chapter, we are reminding that teaching for justice means showing up fully in the pedagogical space, prepared to resist oppressive power structures, whether that's in the institution or in the practices of the classroom. The woman is, this womanist perspective takes seriously the ethical impulses that Dr. Jan has already mentioned several times that motivate black women and black communities and infuse their social activism with integrity and sustained commitment. In reading the, this collection of essays, Communities of Activism, in the time of COVID-19 and all that it means for black and brown bodies, and an increased and sustained attack on black bodies, I was repeatedly reminded of Octavia Butler's novel, Parable of the Sower. Lauren in the novel uh, is a young black woman living and trying to survive in the chaotic and violent-filled world depicted in the novel. She reveals a complicated existence and sometimes, in her case, a hidden relationship to religion. And I would add that we, many of us, have a hidden relationship to education. In the world Butler created, culture, race, gender, and sexuality permeate all aspects of life. From Lauren's first teaching of her newly created religion, Earthseed, she tells us, all that you touch, you change. The only lasting truth is change. God is change. To the way she appears to practice the faith of her father. And she says, at least three years ago, my father's God stopped being my God. His church stopped being my church. But she did not leave right away. She saw the reality of her world and the coming horrors. She carefully, forcefully, and actively imagined another world. She tells us, Change is possible and even inevitable, but you have to touch something. This Professor Shepard, yes. can I say 30 more seconds, unfortunately? Okay. This collection, Communities of Activism, touches Black women's lives in the academy. They remind us that life in the academy in higher education is also a place where Black and Brown women, lesbian, gays, queer, trans, young people, non-binary people are silenced during their education process. Our job is to show up committed and ready. Thank, Thank you for that powerful presentation. Thank you. I'd now like to welcome from South Africa, Nambosa Matibela, activist, researcher, educator, and author of, and they didn't die. Welcome, Numbosa. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Numbuso Matibela. I'm from South Africa, and I'm based in Johannesburg in South Africa. Um, I think for me, I would like to sort of situate this question with um, this, this conversation with one question, um, just for the sake of time, and to then sort of highlight three points that I think are, are quite important to take away from 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 my contribution here. Um, I think 
the question of like the sort of conditions that force activist education into existence um, is a is, a, is like the main question that I think we should we should we, we should be in a way kind of dealing with. And I think it, it what the book does is quite frankly, I think that the book uh, does that quite well throughout the different chapters um, that you will come uh, to, to read. Uh, but the main three points that I think are quite important um, is to understand at the very least um, the sort of underlying relations that need to be organized against, um, that being the first point. Um, within activist education, That, at least I think that that's quite an important um, sort of points that we, we always need to keep in mind. Um, that you have like needing to understand the, the, the relations that reproduce a particular um, condition. Um, and I say this because if we look at a country like South Africa, where I'm based, there are at least two elephants in the room right now um, in the situation that we're in, this pandemic that we're in, um, that have been so highlighted um, and the issues that are actually confronting activist um, educators um, and organizers in South Africa, the question of inequality, the ways in which um, surplus emergence as an idea has created conditions where people either have and people do not have. And at the center of this debate is the question of how do we distribute these goods, you know? Um, and the other question is the question of like gender-based violence um, being one of the key issues in this country. Um, if we look at uh, this, this, like statistics all over the world, South Africa has the highest, the highest, highest rate in the entire world of um, sexual violence um, and domestic violence, specifically against um, black women and black poor women in particular, um, and um, queer, queer, queer people. Um, a lot of killings of particularly lesbian women in the, in 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 this in this in this country, um, which is an underlying issue in itself, and how people relate to personal identities and how personal identities have become so contested um, in public spaces um, in South Africa. Um, so I think those two key issues are are really the things that are, are at the forefront of like. Um, uh, at the forefront of like activist education, like in South Africa, the question the question of economic inequality being one, and the question of gender based violence being the second one, and which is why it's so important to again reiterate the need to like sort of focus on these relations that are reproduced by um, by the conditions of uh, of colonialism, the conditions of apartheid, for instance. Yes. Mbosa, what you have to say is so, so, so worth hearing. However, yeah. I'm going to ask you to say a, a few sentences and then we wind up, yeah? Sure, all right. And I think um, just to, to sort of tie, tie up the, the last two points, um, I think it's important to, at least for activist educators this side, what we've been thinking about is the idea that, you know, the struggle for the distribution of goods, for instance, cannot be separated from personal identity, how people relate, whether they see themselves as black women or they see themselves as workers, how, whatever the, the social category that they choose in that particular time. Um, those, the ways in which we distribute um, um, goods cannot be separated from that. And the last point Thank is that... Um, Thank you so much for that contribution, Nambosa. And the themes that you mentioned, we will be coming back to that. However, I'm going to open the floor now to the contributors of the book to do short readings. I welcome first Professor Patricia Daly from the Department of Human Geography of Africa at Oxford University. Welcome, Patricia Daly. Good evening, everyone. Um, first, I must congratulate uh, Jan and UCL IOE Press for the hard work and commitment that went into the publication of this edited volume. I am delighted to be part of it. I'm a political geographer, born in Jamaica, schooled in the UK, and I work on East African societies 
and on migration. I'm going to read a very brief extract. And, and our experiences of a black woman, I'd, I argue, are made up of multiple interconnected trajectories that operate across different spatial scales and times. As a geographer, I'm interested in what such relationality does for political action. We have seen some solidarity movements scaling up to the global. And I argue that African people in the diaspora have always been dependent on scale, imaginations of multiple scales as a way of transcending and surviving exploitation, whether in dreams of the mother country, back to Africa, Pan-Africanism, or even to the Christian heaven. We've always looked for our emancipation beyond a bounded singular place. We're always reaching out to others who recognize our humanity and share our vision of the potentialities of just futures. Thank you. Can I now welcome Patricia Gilbert, Associate Lecturer at Birkbeck. Hello, thank you very much. I'm just going to read a um, short um, extract from my chapter from the introduction. Um, my chapter aims to provide an introductory discussion on black educational inequalities in the UK, with a particular focus on the history of concerns regarding the attainment of black Caribbean learners in schools and the gap between the percentage of minority ethnic and white students obtaining higher degrees at university. I recently embarked on PhD studies as another step in my journey of lifelong learning. And as a black woman of mixed heritage from a working class background, commencing, commencing research on differential outcomes in education has led to a significant amount of self-reflection, not least on my position as a person embodying diversity, often within a mainly white and middle class academic environment. So it's been hugely important to me to be able to learn from other women of colour within academia and community activism, including those contributing to this publication, and to seek out other black educators and activists committing committed to addressing racial inequalities. I've also found it impossible not to revisit my own experiences as a school pupil and higher education student in the UK in the 70s and 80s, which I refer to while reflecting on the past 50 years of black educational aspiration, exclusion and achievement. Thank you. Can I now welcome Professor Cecile Wright, trade unionist, academic and campaigner. Oh, currently at the University of Nottingham. So mine is chapter four, uh, title, Hello Trouble, Black Women Academics and the Struggle for Change. I'll just read you uh, a short bit. Uh, Hello Trouble, that's the way I, I'm greeted by some people who are white. The tone is usually light-hearted and superficial. However, the frequency of this greeting has led me to reflect upon the use of the word trouble to suggest that I may uh, say things uh, the speaker doesn't approve of or I do things the speaker doesn't approve of. Is the greeter suggesting that I should toe the line, not set up, uh, not upset the apple cart, upset the status quo and above all, know my place? Uh, Patricia Williams, I think, exemplify some of the um, uh, notions uh, that, that informs my understanding of this Hello Trouble when she talks about the lack of the themes, such as the lack of civility mm -hmm. is underwritten by broad habits of courtesy that dictates whose voices count, which bodies are, or, or not capable of speech, witnessing, forming opinion. Who speaks to whom? Who is spoken of? Who do we horrify into silence? And, uh, and among the voices most instantly suppressed, written off and written out are those of black women and girls. Thank you. Can I now welcome Palmela Witter from Positive Futures Fund? Hi, good evening all. Uh, my chapter, chapter five, focuses on black youth, the loss of trust and the crisis of nice crime. Um, and I provide a very short extract into my narrative. This chapter focuses on the increasing number of deaths among black youth in Britain cities from knife crime. 
It does not seek to put forward a definitive answer, but a view of the tragedy through the eyes of a black womanist activist and draws on black feminist epistemology in the work of in the work of Hawks and Lord as a political and theoretical frame to explore the possible role for Britain's struggling black voluntary sector. In exploring the issues, the chapter primarily focuses on London and examines what the UK media, police and others have described as an epidemic of incidents of nice crime now implicating all communities. I discuss what I consider to be the necessary coordinated collectivism within black and ethnic minority communities if we are to help stem the rise of tide of violence in the areas most effective. In arguing for a womanist approach, I will specifically consider the role of the black voluntary sector, which has, for some who may recognise, is disappearing within the, the UK. Thank you. May I welcome Professor Lorraine Jones, Senior Lecturer at University of East London in the Department of Psychosocial Studies. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. My chapter is Chapter 7 in this honorary book, so thank you, Jan, and everyone else who's contributed. My chapter was written, of course, way before the tragic murder of George Floyd and the ensuing focus and protests about the white policing of black bodies. In this chapter, I write from the perspective as a black feminist, mixed heritage academic, but more crucially for me, the mother of black children. Following the inquiry into the racially motivated killing of Stephen Lawrence in 1993, which found the Metropolitan Police institutionally racist, all public authorities must provide mandatory diversity training, which is a program designed to teach employees inclusion, respect and cultural diversity in the workplace. Many UK police services have had an antagonistic relationship with much of the black community for years. And I refer to Angela Davis, where she states, a black boy's flight from the police is just as likely to be a protective measure as it is to result from a consciousness of guilt. In this chapter, I inquire into the topic of race in the diversity training of UK police officers. And I argue that the challenges of this anti-racism training in an organisation created, built and shaped by institutional whiteness has unintended consequences for black youth. Thank you. Can I now welcome Dawn Joseph, who is interested in research on custodial sentencing for black youth. Hi, everybody. Uh, my chapter deals with navigating the UK education system as a single parent of a young black boy. Here is an extract from the letter I wrote to my son, Ryan. So now you're all grown, a graduate and a well-rounded, likable guy. Listening to your reasoning, debating your political stance and your thought-provoking rationale makes me proud to be your mum. But the journey wasn't easy. I don't think it did much for your 14 year old street cred, having your grandmother meet you at the school gates to ensure that you came straight home. But, I cannot, but it cannot be denied that you chose the path all for yourself. And based on my own experiences, if I had to advise a single mother, there would be three things that I would tell her. Uh, one would be always make your children your priority. Our children need our full attention, especially in these times. Uh, the second one would be, your teenager's son isn't the head of the house. Avoid burdening them with responsibilities so they feel like they are forced to find ways of making money to provide for the household. And finally, remind the children of how important they are. Protect them from family feuds and conflict. There's much more in Chapter 8, but I'll pass on to Kamalita. Can I now welcome back Nambosa Matabela, activist and writer. Welcome Nambosa. Hi, uh, my chapter is titled, And They Didn't Die, Black Women and the Silencing of Activist Voices. It's basically um, uh, a study of disappearance through looking at the South African student movements of 2015 and nationalism. So now I will just read a very short paragraph from it. Uh, my chapter highlights the, the struggles and achievements of black women in South Africa, 
who have contributed to a rebalancing of this liberation narrative as a case study and will argue that the, the experience of black women in the UK and across the African diaspora are not dissimilar and they're important lessons to be learned. The em I emphasize the tensions within what has often been recorded solely as the history of racial oppression. Through South Africa's student movement, I suggest that black women's political representation and insistence on political subjectivity and agency has partly come out of a collective desire to recognize the contributions of generations who have been rendered invisible and disappeared from, the popular, from popular history. While South Africa's history together with the brutalities experienced in popular struggles is emerging more publicly as time goes by, this is, the le this, this, this is less the case for um, the internal struggles within celebrated popular movements. Thank you. Great. Can I now welcome Jen Davis, who works in Parliament and co-host of Consensus Podcast. Okay, thank you. Um, so my chapter focuses on um, sorry, whiteness in denial, um, about promoting cultural specific culture co um, co coaching conversations in higher education. And I'm just going to read an extract from um, the chapter and I'm going to be speaking on um, what well, reading about Black Campus Radio introducing a new learning platform in conversation with Black youth. Black women are having a new conversation with Black youth and they want this to be spread to wider audiences. Black youth have a desire to open up about their frustrations and ways in which they can aspire and reach academic heights. We want to learn about the successes and frustrations of young Black people in higher education. We seek to engage with their learning discourse as well as on, issue, um, as, well as on issues impacting the wider Black community. In their networks, young Black women are already forging ahead and have developed online radio conversations on lifestyle issues. It is now time for the university to build on this good practice and develop campus learning conversations with Black undergraduates. The crisis of Black youth has many strands and is rooted in a system of problems, including issues related to education. Thank you. Can I now take the opportunity to welcome Fina Dow, poetess, theatre practitioner, and joint author with Nefertiti Gale of Lioness Chant. Welcome, Fina. Welcome. I will be following on from Jen's um, paragraph, Black Campus Radio introducing a new learning platform in our conversation with Black youth. We believe that pushing the Black brand is a major imperative as our lifestyle choices are informed by a dominant Eurocentric society. Radio is an important to confront issues that are often little understood. In our culture-specific discussions, we speak of buying black products and also promoting natural black hair that to some may appear naive in a world where freedom of choice are considered the norm. However, buying black is also key to educating black children to be proud of their culture especially as they are grown up in a society where to be black is often to be left behind on the educational ladder. Thank you. Can I now welcome Professor Yuvani Mayer, Professor of Education at the University of Bedfordshire. Um, good evening, everyone. My chapter focuses on supporting black sisters in UK higher education. And I'm going to read a short extract from my chapter, chapter 11. Many of the black women students I have encountered are from working class backgrounds. As such, they come up at times against institutional structures that advocate wider participation and encourage working class participation but in practice cannot accommodate students who lack economic security. Universities are essentially white middle-class institutions 
And this accentuates black women's middle class, sorry, women's class differences. They're also subject to demands from their community. Right, These right. students expect black academics to view their study and assignments as a shared community concern. This is why black female students need and demand racialized and gendered community support from black women academics. This is another pressure not experienced by white academics. Despite some shared experiences of gender, white colleagues don't share the same racialized community expectations nor do they have personal investment in individual black female students completing their courses successfully. Each black female success is one step closer to uplifting the community, and it is black women who largely bear the responsibility for educating black children, their own and others, and even their grandchildren. Thank you. I'd like to say a big thank you. I don't know how to do a virtual applause but I'd like to before I do that I'd like to welcome back again Jan Dr Jan Etienne so um just a short extract from whiteness acknowledging the challenges and silences in higher education currently the university is facing quite a backlash for daring to tackle whiteness daring to decolonize its curriculum and make it a better more rewarding place for both black and white students. Whiteness and its generally unknowledged normative power continues to be a barrier for us, for change, embedded as it is in the culture of higher education institutions, as racist behaviors, attitudes, emotions, actions, those microaggressions, those unconscious bias, those things which prevent the progress of black staff as well as black students. Those things, individuals' behaviors are indeed protected by structures and they are very much protected by the everyday practices in higher education. Conversations in the media are influential and debates on measures to decolonize our curriculums outside the lecture theater takes different forms. Some commentators are offended by blacks who agitate about race, racism, and colonialism. We hear this every day. What's the problem with the status quo, they ask. Are we implying that well-respected white professors are unsuitable or should not be trusted to lecture on is issues such as the ills of imperialism. These are the challenges we face. These are the challenges that we are working towards, particularly in my university, particularly at Birkbeck University of London. It is a struggle to take on board these issues of whiteness, but we intend to move forward at this time. Thank you. Thank you to all the contributors. It is now time to open the floor for Q&A. So please post, I hope you've posted your questions in the chat room. Jan and Melissa will try to answer those questions and I will be back with you in a few minutes. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm Thank you so much, Kamalita. I'm definitely not going to answer the questions. It's all over to you. Uh, I, I just, I'm going to summarize. There's been so many comments on the in the chat bar while you've been all speaking, and uh, people have been clearly so impressed by your words. People feeling inspired, validated, feeling that you're telling their stories. Words of wisdom, strong voices. Um, the importance and timeliness of what you've been talking about, that it's been powerful and moving. So many, many, many congratulations uh, to everybody for this evening. Um, there's been quite a few people commenting on the idea of trouble, uh, this idea of hello trouble, um, several feeling that they related to this idea. My, my own feeling is that I think we can all agree that uh, you all should be out there making as much trouble as you possibly can. More power to you. Make, go make trouble. 
Um, I've got a few questions and a couple of comments from people. So the first one is from CJC, and this is for Patricia and for Jan. And um, CJC would like to know your views on the UK GCSE and A-level results being awarded by teacher prediction and algorithm. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think it, it is uh, problematic. Um, I know that the Running Me Trust um, has written uh, to the government about this and, and asked um, for um, contextualised applications to be considered. But there is research that has been done to show that um, bias can play a factor. So um, if results are to some extent going to be based on, on teacher predictions uh, but, you know, um, or teacher assessment, then I think it, that it is problematic and could uh, exasperate the problem we have with the awarding gap at, at the moment. So um, I haven't heard anything anything more since the Running Me Trust uh, wrote, wrote to the government about, about that. But I don't think there has been um, any response to say that anything different will be done apart from, I, th I think, is it the case that students can elect to, to take their, their exams um, if they don't want to go for the um, uh, uh, teacher assessed and um, based, uh, marked based on their um, mock exam. But yes, I think it is certainly something that's problematic. Yes, and I, I definitely feel that at this time, we really need to concern ourselves with this issue of not having um, this sufficient number of black teaching staff involved in this kind of um, arena. And this is a problem that we have if, for example, we had a situation where we were in a position to confidently say that, um, yes, all individuals who are represented on these boards, on these assessment teams, are mixed, then, of course, we probably would not be having that problem. We probably would not be having that discussion. So I, too, worry very much about this feeling that it is very much based on the thoughts the tutors may have about one particular student. Oh, this is a black youth, so that particular student is not likely to do, to fare well. So we will make certain that that particular student, for example, does not get a merit or a distinction. So that is a worry. But we also need to think about how we move forward in this. And I think that there is a, um, a move which will, you know, look at how we involve and how we increase the potential to include um, tutors, assessors of a mixed variety. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Jan, and thanks, Patricia. So. We have a comment actually from Pat um, and several other uh, participants um, have also mentioned this, the importance of intersectionality. So I wondered if, if, um, if whoever would like to respond actually would like to maybe to celebrate on how important you think intersectionality is to the struggles of social justice. I, I need to stress that in the chapters, particularly Patricia Gilbert's chapter, um, this issue of taking concern with, it is not just about the colour of the individual student, it is very much about that social background that that student comes from. It is very much about all those other issues, not just the individual race of that student or the individual race of that member of staff. We must take on board all the other issues. Crenshaw made a very sort of good case for us that, you know, if we can um, concern ourselves with double discrimination, um, such as gender um, and race, then we've really got to take on board the issue of poverty, the issue of where and how students learn, the issue of money, um, how it is that we may find ourselves in a situation where learning, the environment where we learn, becomes a non-issue. But this wider um, concerns, the problems that we face, it may even be, for example, as a situation where um, in this COVID-19 um, situation, currently we have students 
black students with caring responsibilities, students with additional responsibilities as single parents. And intersectionality plays quite a crucial part. And what we find is that black students in particular are often overburdened with those additional concerns. Very important. Thank you, Jan. So a question from Linda for Palmera. Um, how can activists use the current momentum of Black Lives Matters and Justice for Black Lives to shift the perceptions of police in denial? A very big question um, and a challenge in itself. Um, I have found that when working with a number of our young people, they firstly, they wouldn't class themselves as being activists. They see themselves as just young people facing a challenge, facing the issue of being picked upon. And the issues around George Floyd has highlighted um, their struggles. So working with the police is going to be a, um, an onerous task. And it's about how do we support those young people to build trust when the trust has been broken from, as, some, as, one, as my grandchild said to me, 400 years. If it's taken 400 years to get to this stage, it's going to take another 400 years for change to come about. But we've got to start somewhere. And... It's about having more dialogue with young people working alongside um, the police and other um, community programs. But I don't have the answers. My books, my book, my chapter in the, in the book does state I do, we don't have the answers, but we've got to start somewhere. And although I ask a lot of questions, some of the questions are about looking at us as a community, what more can we do? It's not so much putting it onto the young people, but what can we as activists do? So it's about um, holding that mantle up, holding institutions to account, challenging, as somebody said, being that trouble and even having the voice of being that trouble, people are not going to like you, they're not going to want you to sit at the table, they're not going to want you to bring forward their issues and concerns. But if we as parents, activists, brothers and sisters cannot do that to support the young people, we will be having these conversations again in on, on, more, on more on a regular basis. But we have to start somewhere. And Black Lives Matters is giving them the platform to actively go out there, hold their hand up and say, we're not having this anymore. We're going to fight the fight. And we, as parents, adults, activists, will be supporting them in doing that. And I think if I could just add to that, um, in this uh, arena of Black Lives Matter, we've got to take on board our own organisation. And I think it was Patricia Daly who made reference some time ago to the fact that we can be insiders, but we can also be outsiders, just to make certain that we, at every stage that we consider, it is just the same. What is actually occurring in America, it is occurring in the very same way, very same way in this country. And so we've really got to think about our individual roles and speaking out at every opportunity, speaking out whether this may be in the actual um, lectures that we deliver, whether this is on the in our separate roles, um, working with funded organizations to tackle that. I don't think Black Lives Matter should go away. I think we've got to take on board what it is that we do to make certain that it is there, that the answers are answered. Thank you, Jan and Pamela. Uh, so we have a question from Kathy. Um, I have to sort of, forgive me for channeling people's words, by the way. It's, uh, we don't have a better way of, of doing this yet. I'm open to suggestions, but um, uh, this is Kathy's question. Um, and it's to Professor Shepherd. 
Um, how do we infuse social activism with integrity and sustained commitment effectively without being labeled the angry black woman? Uh, or, or does Kathy make peace and embrace uh, that, that identity, or she may not use that term, but being angry and, or assertive, perhaps is the better word, rather than the label angry? Mm. A group of um, black women students asked me that very same question about a year ago. And I said to them, if we're not angry black women, there's something wrong with us, because there's a lot to be angry about. And I think that um, as the book demonstrates, being angry black women means, of course, showing up, speaking up, but also doing the work we need to do to be informed when we're doing that. And if, if, if anger is that, I'm not sure why. Sorry, please mute mics. If anger comes with that, I believe that's a sign of health. I think that we, in many places, have been raised to be afraid of our anger because we have swallowed hook, line, and sinker, the Kool-Aid that says, if we present it in a way that we're not angry, people will listen. We know that that has not been the case. If we're nice, if we're ladies, if we're not, not too black, too grown, you know, show up and show up, but do the work. What you're saying is based in Sorry, sorry, Professor Shepard, could you do that last, the last 30 seconds again, because we had some strange um, reverb happening. Would you be able to repeat the last minute? Sure. Uh, I'm just saying show up angry, but show up informed. You know, show up having read this whole volume, taking notes on it. It's what my dean here calls show up with something in your back pocket. Mm -hmm. Uh, so this is a question from Lynn Barber to, to anyone in the panel. Uh, as a white teacher, what is her best uh, next step in the classroom? Anybody like to go for that? I, I'm, I'm an academic. I'm not I'm in a schoolroom. Um, I teach uh, university students. Um, and I think the approach would be to be open, to be engaged and not to be afraid of discussing issues of race or racism, and in, in particular racism, because they, um, we live in a racist society. Um, we live um, in an era of racial capitalism. And unless we confront racism, um, we are doing, you're doing harm to, your, to ourselves as two teachers to yourselves as white people, as well as to black people. And there's a, a number of studies have been published recently to demonstrate the harm that racism does to everyone in our society. And, and in particular to young people, um, as they learn about how to live and, and survive um, within uh, particularly white dominated communities. So I think, you know, finding ways of um, talking about racism would actually open up the discussion and would make students feel more comfortable and also would promote a form of allyship, which I think it's really needed. Uh, and I'll stop there. Yes, and if I could just add that our pedagogy um, tells us that we need to be interested in the learner. We need to be interested in the learner's experience. And this is something which I strongly feel we need to return to. We need to think about those experiences of black students, of working class students, in order to make our pedagogy um, brilliant at this particular stage. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from William. Does decolonizing take us further towards educational liberation than previous anti-racist activism? Who's that for? Uh, anyone, open, open to the floor. Would anybody like to take that? One thing I would say is that decolonizing does move us in that direction until it's appropriated by the colonizer and becomes the means by which they uh, advance in their career, et cetera. And we've seen that in multiple disciplines. So 
we have to continuously interrogate um, not only our sources, our disciplines, but the ways in which the processes of our institutions work to value that work in, in, when some speak of it and devalue it when others, black and brown folks, speak of it. And I do think it's a different time now. Um, we are living in a world where social media um, takes such a illuminating form that decolonizing, um, whether it's the curriculum, whether it's the university, it is very different to these anti-racist strategies, which are very much, um, to a large extent, localized, national. They have a different meaning. But I feel that there is a very different sense at this particular time. At this time, we are doing it, decolonizing in a very different way, in a global way. Um, black women, particularly the women on the Womanism, Activism and Higher Education Research Network, are decolonizing with having conversations with people who are doing it. We are learning from each other. And I'm very hopeful that as we move on, we will see results. We will see change. I'll take this opportunity to introduce the publisher, Dr. Gillian Klein from Trent Books, and ask her about signed editions and other things that normally happens at a book launch. Um, Dr. Gillian Klein, are you there? Yeah, but I'm delighted to be with you, even at the very end. I think you have done something absolutely fantastic. You have shaken up the academic institution. You have shaken up academia with your two books and are to be congratulated. No one had thought that um, elderly women, women my age or more from the Caribbean were worth um, serious academic study and you showed how important their contribution is and how important they are to each other and how in fact independent they are of a racist society. It was very impressive. Now you've moved a little closer to something uh, more um, conventional if you like, although Trentham's books have never been very conventional, but you have said this, say, you've given the same kind of very significant, very important, very valuable voice to the, uh, to the world of academia with drill music and young black people and uh, boys protecting themselves and playing it safe and how women are working towards this. So I, I am incredibly impressed with you, Jan. And I'm almost sorry that I'm going out of publishing at this stage because I would have liked to have published your next book. But I wish you lots of luck and I hope we'll stay in touch. And I'm sending love to you and love to you all. Well done, Jan. Well done, Jan Etienne. I love your book. And I hope, I hope, hope, hope that you like the cover and the book. So Hi, lots Gillian. of luck. Margie will tell you how you can get your copies and I'll say well done and leave it at that. Thank you, Gillian. Margie, would you like to uh, come uh, in? Sorry, <laughs> sorry for the delay. Um, yet yeah, the um, discount code has been set up, so all um, attendees can receive 25% off um, with Communities of Act Activism code. Um, and this runs um, until the 31st of this month, that um, offer. And it will be um, available from the website, the UCL IOE Press website. Okay, thanks for that. Can I take this opportunity to ask again, Dr. Etienne, if there are any closing remarks before I thank the contributors today and pass on to Finia? Yes, indeed, there are. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to 
very much thank the publisher, Gillian Klein. Um, I have to also say, um, folks, um, in terms of higher education, academic books, books um, published by the Institute of Education, um, UCL University College London Press, um, you need to know that there are very few publishers willing to take on board some of our manuscripts. I have to tell you that Gillian has been around for a little while in relation to academic publications which relate to social justice, which relate to race relations. And I just feel so sad that at this particular point, with my second book, the Gillian is retiring. She has been somebody who has assisted in, I cannot sort of begin to name some of the publications um, which she has agreed, which, which she has published, basically. And so, Gillian, thank you very much for your contribution. This is not the end. Definitely not the end. And the other thing I want to say is that I also want to remind everybody that um, this book is indeed a collaboration. Every single author in this publication is just as important in relation to that overall authorship. And I have to, once again, you know, thank my contributors, every single one of them. A couple of them are not here tonight. Um, actually, just one of them, um, Ezimo Chigbo, um, who is recording um, at this current moment in time. But I sincerely thank you all mm. for your marvelous contribution. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank Janet. You. Can I also now say that I would like to thank the audience. I would like to thank all the participants. It has been a great evening. And for technical support, Will, thank you. And for hosting the Department of Geography. And I'd like to take one minute. I'd love the last applause, but I'd like to give this book a huge applause. So if you could all unmute your mic for one minute and give a huge round of applause. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations, congratulations. congratulations. Well done, Ben. Well done. Well, and this piece is called We Have Come. It's time to change, rearrange the set. We have come to collect a long overdue debt. No credit. You have had it far too long, and the higher purchase agreement has gone wrong. So, we come to collect what is rightfully ours and the interest that is owed. If you don't pay up in full, we will tread on your toes. Just like you did when you took our land. Just like you did a Bible gun in your hand. Just like you did when you herded us on the ships to make that long, never-ending trip. We come for what is now due. We have come and we want our land too. We have come, but we will never ever stoop as low as you. We have come, we have come, we have come, we have come. Thank you. Thank you, Pina. And with that, I say enjoy the book, debate it, discuss, and thank you for attending the virtual book launch of Communities of Activism, Black Women, Higher Education, and the Politics of Representation. Thank you. Thank you.